Welcome to a virtual version of the Lord's Day service for April 16th, 2023. I'll start by reading some scripture. Our first reading is from uh, 1 Peter. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold that though perishable is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. You rejoice in the indes indescribable and joyous or glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Our second reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, after Jesus has resurrected. Hear what the Spirit saying to the church. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the flip fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he had been raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. The second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had, he had said it to them the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten the belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, with these words that I just read from the last chapter of John, the risen Christ, the risen Christ Jesus, commissions Peter to take care of his sheep. He does this not only once, but he does it three times. And these words are shared with Peter around a charcoal fire with the smell of grilled fish in the dawn of a new morning by the lakeshore. It was only a few evenings earlier around another charcoal fire when Peter denied Jesus three times. What happened to Peter? How could this bumbling frightened Peter in the courtyard become the bold Peter that who preached the gospel in Acts 2? Or how is it that this Peter could be the beautifully eloquent Peter of 1 Peter? Is this the same person? Is he really the one Jesus said would be the foundation of his church? Peter's growth and evolution from fisherman to disciple to apostle 
to being a wise elder, one who would write his epistles, is amazing. Only in Paul do we see a wider range of time and growth of a person in the New Testament. Several parts of, his ser of this sermon that I'm preaching to you now come from a sermon that I preached in 2020 using the same readings. And I love these scriptures so much, I really wanted to look back and see how my perspective has changed over the last few years. The last time I preached was over Zoom from to my church in Oregon, and I asked Jeff, uh, my pastor at the time, uh, who came to my ordination last year, if I could take that Sunday to preach. And because it was right in the middle of my seminary experience, and I was in a New Testament survey class, and I needed to preach a, to do a sermon and preach in order to support a term paper that I was writing. And Jeff graciously agreed to let me do it. Besides, I think he was probably exhausted from Holy Week <laughs> and all of the stresses that he was under to set up Zoom worship. Remember that in 2020, what a stressful time that was? Now, like all biblical studies classes, there were lots of technical aspects of how you approach scripture. The task is to analyze the scriptures using different techniques and then explain them to a congregation in a way that is not too technical, so that, and, but still give the congregation enough to chew on. And the professor assigned this to us uh, to help us to describe, learn how to describe an ap academic sub subject in a way that is useful to everyone. And now it's a big task, but it's a very good uh, training experience for ministry and for preaching. Now, the idea for the sermon was actually sparked by a conflict that I experienced back then. It was in a Bible study on 1 Peter. The leader is a very... Uh, uh, very much into history, uh, and he's very much into history of the Bible. Uh, you know, he knows all about when the books were written, who the likely authors were actually, uh, who wrote the, wrote the books, the historical reasons for each book, and in a way that kind of casts doubt on many of the traditional ideas we have about the scriptures, and seemingly having to prove everything for its veracity and its reliability. Now, one of the Bible study members objected to this, saying that Peter wrote the letter, and that it's dishonoring to the authority of Scripture to say otherwise. And as I sometimes do did in that group, and still do sometimes, is I played the role of uh, moderator between these two positions. I said, they, you're both correct. You're both right, that the scriptures are authoritative, but it's also good to analyze them and understand them and understand where they came from. The trouble comes when we think about that, when we think about how scripture happened and what it is that gets in the way from the messages that we are to learn from it. Now, historical criticism goes way back. It's very deep in our Presbyterian heritage. We try to prove everything in and around the Bible. That's being Presbyterian. You know, history is important. You know, um, archaeology has borne a lot of fruit <clears throat> about the veracity of Scripture. So we have learned a lot. But I think that we Reformed Christians take this way too far. As Walter Brueggemann, you know, who is a biblical scholar of the highest caliber, he has said that this obsession with the historical basis for Scripture has become a great enemy of preaching. Because the analysis of Scripture has become a stumbling block in our tradition, our Reformed church Presbyterian tradition. Scholars have argued about the Gospel of John for centuries. Was chapter 21, which I just read from, an appendix added by a later editor? It kind of looks like it when you look at the language. Did Jesus really ask Peter three times? 
Some scholars will say that this is a literary device to show the forgiveness of Peter after denying Jesus three times. But if we spend all of our effort doing this, we completely miss out on feeling the warmth, hearing the crackling of a charcoal fire, smelling grilled fish, and seeing the sun rise over the Sea of Galilee. If we miss this in scripture, it's a great shame. Or what about the authorship of 1 Peter? <clears throat> the Greek is so beautifully elegant in this book. There's no way that a non-native Greek speaker, especially a simple fisherman like Peter, could have written such beautifully elegant Greek. Did Silvanius, Peter's companion, we know about Silvanius, did he actually write it? Maybe. Was it written by somebody else much later in the name of Peter? We don't know. But again, uh, approaching scripture with this mindset stifles our appreciation of its beauty. If we only analyze it, we can't hear Peter's melodic words. Controlling the narrative instead of letting a story unfold can turn us into theological pretzels. So many Christians try to find hidden meanings in scripture, desperately trying to find the story behind the text as if it exists apart from the text. Or worse yet, they try to codify a, a <clears throat> pardon me, a rule book from scripture, missing the big picture of God's steadfast love. The story of Peter isn't about an instant conversion or instant change. It's about unfolding. It's about his growth and his change over time. If we only take his denial, we miss his faithfulness. If we only take his impulse, impulsiveness, which he had in abundance, we miss his steadiness and his soundness of mind. If we only take his simplicity as a fisherman, then we miss his subtlety and his leadership abilities. Jesus chose Peter for a reason, and only when we see him in the total narrative can we see why. Peter is the same person throughout all of these scenes because he has that much of that same urgency and power of personality. But Peter is a round character, somebody that we see from many sides with depth and nuance. The narrative, the unfolding story, is what we get from Scripture. Fretting over authorship or authority of Scripture just gets in the way. When people engage in these battles about where the scriptures came from or you know how authoritative they are, they're placing demands on the God's messages through the Holy Spirit. It's like handcuffing and strangling the scripture to fit our agendas instead of listening and feeling what it does to our hearts. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, and the beauty of the language. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Even in English, you can hear the beautiful flow of the Greek. This is a this has such a beautiful, melodic, poetic sound to it. Throughout, in fact, uh, both epistles from Peter, like the crackling fire by the lake shore, it's something to be felt, experienced, tasted, and smelled, not to be picked apart. When I reveal, reviewed that past sermon, I realized that I was kind of fighting that battle of authority and authorship within myself at the time. And it made me realize that these passages and Peter's growth in ministry have had a profound effect of, of, uh, over me in the last three years. 
your spiritual maturity as a congregation, your hunger for learning as a congregation have greatly inspired me. I really see it in our Bible studies and in your comments, the things that you tell me back, and you have allowed me to push you, in perhaps in places where you're not comfortable going, and struggle with the word together. And sometimes you've pushed back, but always in gentleness and love. I'm incredibly grateful to be journeying with you. This is why a narrative reading of scripture is so important. We cannot control our futures. We don't know what's coming for us. We can't bind the Bible up and turn it into an astrology book. We can only let the narrative play out. Instead of fretting over verses and trying to divine meanings in isolation, it's important to look at the whole narrative. I like to say that you know much more about the Bible than you think, because you have the vast experiences of life, and we can see a lot about our lives in this narrative. I also will say that you know a lot less about the verses that you're certain about. Picking rules out of the narrative is a fool's errand. And it's important to know the context and narrative of verses so that we don't make these verses into oppressive props, as they often are, for ideas that really just need to go away. Instead, the Bible is a journey and that we journey with the Bible. As we grow into our spiritual practices, as we pray and as we study together, we share our lives together. Let us make sure that as we live out the narratives of our lives, the, li the narrative of our faith as a church, we put away the striving and the analysis and feel the warmth of the fire, bask in the beauty of the language. For our faith in God is more precious than gold, and it is refined in the fire of living in the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Holy God, in your name we serve, in your spirit we grow, and with the touch of Jesus we heal. Inspire us to see the whole story of our ministry together as it unfolds. Help us to pay attention to our growing relationship with you, to not fret over small things, to not dwell on setbacks, but to boldly reach out and do your work no matter what. In the blessed name of Jesus Christ, amen.